I want to start this off by saying if you haven't seen Prey yet, you should definitely go watch it. It was actually really good and really well done. Not like that wretched abomination Aliens vs. Predators. Good God, what even was that? 300 years ago, back before the United States was coast to coast and the country was the most, but then again, I could be biased, a threat would emerge seemingly from nowhere, and to the native people on the ground, it seemed like a sign. And unfortunately, they were in modern day Oklahoma. A young woman who wants to become a hunter, unlike her mother, spots this anomaly in the sky and determines, yep, it's good enough for me, and begins hunting something that can actually hunt her back. You see, the issue is, though, that unlike a lion or a bear, this thing is likely more intelligent than humans and also can literally fist fight a bear and win. As she becomes more aware that this thing isn't the average sand warrior, it becomes a game of hunter becoming the hunted becoming the hunter once more. The predator that touched down on Earth, however, seems different. Sure, this is 300 years ago in the past and technology can change, but even still, the physical morphology of this creature is different as well as the different facial structure, and it all seems to point to a new variation of predator, at least prior to the events of the jungle with Anul. So in today's episode, we'll discuss the movie, the changes to the predator in Prey, and what may have brought on these physical changes through evolutionary pathways being unlocked due to geological location. But first, this episode is sponsored by Audible. Are you ready to start listening to thousands and thousands of all-you-can-listen-to audiobooks, original entertainment, and podcasts included in the Plus catalog? Well, I am, because for some reason in a few days, I'm driving from Georgia to Washington because flying is an abomination and I don't understand it. By visiting audible.com forward slash Roanoke or texting Roanoke to 500 500, you can start listening with your free 30-day trial, giving you access to the aforementioned. Look, road trips are great, and as great as they are, they can get tedious. By listening to a story as you drive along, it can really help you to remain focused and stop you from slipping into autopilot mode. But you don't just have to listen while on road trips. You can listen to it while on the train or maybe even working out. Really, there's no wrong place to actually listen to audiobooks. I personally, as always, with Wrath of the Lich King on the horizon, I've just kind of been mainlining World of Warcraft lore like an Ultra Chad. But they have audiobooks for literally everyone of all genres, so there's definitely something for you to enjoy. Plus, Audible members get one credit every month, good for any title in the premium selection, and that is yours to keep forever. So if that sounds interesting to you, by heading to audible.com forward slash Roanoke or texting Roanoke to 500-500, you can begin your 30-day free trial today. All right, let's get back to it. So we kick off our story with another story. A long time ago, a monster came to these people. As a woman sleeps, she is then kicked awake, which that would be kind of annoying. And a dog that was actually rescued IRL the county above me in Georgia looks on. This will be her hunter slash side prey companion. Hopefully nothing really happens to him. As she exits the domicile, she's gathering along with the rest of her tribe. But as she continues to pick the food out of the ground and everything, basically gathering, she's not really feeling it, Mr. Krabs. Can't blame her. So she heads into the forest to practice her axe throwing, and she's actually pretty good at it. Heading behind a log, she then spots a deer, but it gets spooked by a sudden noise in the sky. Giving chase with her dog, she misses her shot, but her dog then gets its tail trapped in probably like a small game trap. It's definitely not a bear trap because I think that would just take the tail off. But this indicates that there are actually trappers in the area. She gives him some medicine before hearing more thunder overhead. Heading to a clearing, she spots it and the clouds above something is moving through. A rather large ship. And then we get it. Pray! You'll see. Later on, she's hanging out with her brother. She's practicing the bow shot, but as she makes fun of her brother, my man literally just nails a trick shot. <laughs> Good lord. Nauru tells Tabe, and I'm like 40% sure I'm saying that correctly, that she saw the thunderbird this morning in the sky and it's her turn to prove that she could be a hunter. Now, we get something weird that says that they're in the Northern Great Plains in 1789, but it's confirmed that they're also in Oklahoma, and I don't think I would really think that is the Northern Great Plains. Heading back into camp, she begins to help with her mom, because apparently they are the medicine-making family of the group. She is sent out, as we finally spot the ship flying overhead, and Predator basically using hacks to make himself invisible, or at least really hard to see. And look, we're on a side tangent here. I don't doubt that the Predator is a great hunter. I just think that if they didn't have all that armor and advanced tech, they'd kind of suck. Like, bro, we can't see you because you're a giant nerd who attacks every species. Like, woo. Like, could I beat a predator in a fist fight? Probably not. But then again, could a predator spot me if I was wearing a cold suit? Also, no. I'm just saying, if this was like a level-based system, this is like a 70 rogue going after level 5 warriors. Yeah, you can beat them, but you're also a clown for doing so. Basically, predators, easy GG once invisibility is removed, even with our modern tech. Off that soapbox, as Nara returns to camp, a hunting party is heading out to find a lion that has been spotted in the area, because you really don't want mountain lions hanging out with you at your camp, and it appears as though it may have attacked someone. Later, as nature continues to nature, Predator finds a snake and just straight up rips that thing's spine out. God! As the party continues to hunt, the dog is able to find lion scat and ultimately find the injured hunter. Nairo applies medicine to him, but holy lord, that doesn't look like it's gonna heal up right. She gives him this, like, orange medicine, which apparently makes his blood cold. Nairo questions why he's still alive, and if something scared the lion away, as Tabe elects to just stay out there and then continue hunting for the lion. That said, Nairo finds the snake from 
earlier on the way back with no spine and completely skin, but it does still have some active nerves in its muscles. Next to it, a giant footprint of something much larger. Nara points out that this is kind of concerning, so she goes back to warn her brother as another is sent with her. We also see the spine of the snake is actually still up in the tree. Attempting to track her brother, she now spots more tracks. Nara finds her brother and warns him that something she thinks is not a bear is out there, but they are in the lion's hunting grounds now, so they need to focus on that. See, the world is just full of predators right now. Naru says that she thinks the lions aren't actually hunting them, but they elect to just sort of bait the cat in, and her brother tells her that this is her Katamiya, basically hunting the thing that's hunting you. So up in the tree, it's her and another guy who's just talking the maddest smack about her, like, oh, you're too scared to fire your bow, and your brother and I will take the lion. I don't know why he sounds like this, but trust me, he just sounds like this. Anyways, as he's talking smack, he gets taken by said lion. Now, Angry Kitty Extraordinaire has climbed up in the tree. Backing Naru up, in the distance, she sees a red light, which kind of distracts her for a moment as the lion jumps at her and she stabs it. Waking back up at camp, her brother has carried her all the way home and then went back out after the lion. A little later on, he returns with its head, even though that was technically Naru's kill, as Tabe is then promoted to war chief, having taken out the lion. Also, some dude in the background is like super upset by this news, apparently, as he just turns away like really kind of like a douche. Anyways, Naru tries to tell her that they need to go back out there as something else is clearly in the area. She gets into a fight over who killed the lion with her brother, talking about how she couldn't finish the job. The next morning, she's kicked again, at like early morning, which bro, there's gotta be a better way of waking her up. She instead elects to not go and do that, and instead heads out to hunt while everyone else walks the other way. You see, it's a dichotomy. We get the long walkthrough where she spots green blood and large footprints. Something has injured the creature. She measures the print and realizes this ain't no bear. We see the predator watching a wolf give chase to a rabbit before it totally has the wolf bite the predator. As the wolf goes to attack, it's an eviscerated, and that's pretty much that. It then takes its head, and again, that's that, Mrs. That's That. Naru at this point probably does the most intelligent thing I think I've ever seen anyone in a movie do, actually attach a rope to the thing that she throws so that she can retrieve it more easily. And by doing so, she is able to catch a few rabbits and eat for the night, which actually, if you didn't know, you cannot live off rabbit alone. It's called rabbit starvation. Rabbit meat is so lean that you will become deficient in fat and carbohydrates, which can lead to malnutrition, which is pretty wild. In a cave, we also see the predator is able to completely melt the face meat and hair off of bone. He stands up as he hears the dog barking and begins his next hunt. Naru continues to head to the ridge and then spots a field of bison all missing their skin with their heads still attached. Yeah, things were actually pretty messed up back in the day, that's for sure. She spots a cigar and the traps, meaning that this was a human thing, not a predator thing. We also see that the cloaking system still messes up in water, meaning that after 300 years, they still hadn't addressed that problem. As Naru continues to inspect for signs of what she really doesn't know because she's not sure what she's even hunting, Mr. Predator ends up coming across the same buffalo and finding the cigar and leaf that she put on the creature. Naru still can't get out to what amounts as quicksand, which by the way, quicksand isn't all that quick. Just don't move that much and you can pretty much hang out in it all day. But eventually she's able to pull herself out, which I thought was going to totally be like the original Predator. Like, oh, how apropos that you fell in there and then the Predator shows up. But nope, total fake out. As then she goes and gets cleaned up. After cleaning up in a dirty mud puddle, a bear has found itself a deer down by the river. And here's where things are about to go absolutely wild. As the bear catches her scent, she raises her bow, but then snaps the line out of place. As the bear climbs up, Sari the dog gets its attention and it gives chase. Now a dog's top speed, unless it's a greyhound, is around 30 miles per hour, while a grizzly's is around 35 miles per hour. But the dog has got him beaten agility. Also for the Euro Bros out there, and really the rest of the planet, that comes out to the dog running at about 48 kilometers per hour, and the grizzly at 56 kilometers per hour. Naru goes to give chase as Sari outjuked the bear, but Barry McBearface is hot on its tail. Running to a beaver dam, she gets inside as the bear attacks it, but then stops, turning its attention to something else unseen. Naru can't really see what this thing is, but it's literally whooping the predator's ass for like just a moment. Right up until Predator punches it so hard, it snaps its neck. Holding the bear above its head, Naru then elects to GTFO because nope. Like literally, anything that just took out a bear with its bare hands, <laughs> yeah, I'm probably running too. Moving downstream, she gets out of the water and has nothing. She hears some twigs snap and it's the rest of the tribe. Naru says that she saw this thing basically take out a bear. They ask how come it didn't take out her then, and the party is basically done with Naru at this point. They have a right proper domestic over the fact that they need to bring her home. Predator then watches from the treetops and spots a spear, understanding that, hey, these things that I just found have the ability to attack. As one of the group goes to take a squat Jurassic Park 2 style when he's eating by compies, a bunch of possums come running towards the group. Naru asks, what does she think was driving the possums this way? Mr. Leader of the group goes out there to see what exactly this is as laser sights appear on his body. Three bolts fly out and take him out pretty quickly. The rest of the group waits as then something just straight walks up to the body and starts pulling out the bolts. The Preds has arrived as the rest of the group attack and square
square up with this thing. And actually, I mean, they aren't doing great, but they're not really doing terrible either. One guy gets thrown while the other gets his arm cut off before his head gets taken. Another then runs up and stabs him in the foot before he's stabbed and just basically stapled to a log as in the Predator turns on Naru. She bolts out into a clearing as a squat man from earlier grabs her. This thing can see through heat as they're really hiding in the grass and that's not helping. As it walks towards them, they attempt to blend in, but it's really having no issue identifying exactly where they are. The guy then draws an arrow as the thing easily outruns him and takes him out, which she just keeps running. It begins giving chase to her before she's captured by a trap from the real villain of our story, the French. And I'm legally required to say that's a joke. Oh my god. You know, I made this joke before and this dude wrote me like a dissertation in the comments about Lord knows what. It was literally the meme, that's a lot of words. Too bad I'm not reading them. The Predator then finds the chain, seeing that she's trapped and elects to leave her alone as there's no glory in the kill. She is then knocked out and taken to their camp. As Naru wakes up in a cage, they're yelling at her dog like true villains. This guy's name is simply Big Beard and his group is the one who killed the buffalo. He then like pokes her with a stick a few times like an absolute weirdo as one guy then asks what she saw. He can speak Comanche so there's communication. They have come into contact with the Predator just prior and they need to know what it is. They then show her that they have her brother and slice him across his chest and stomach. The trap is set. They use them as bait. Tabi found that Naru was hunting this thing the whole time and also, man, you know, the horses appear a little agitated behind the Frenchman. As the French continue to watch their bait, the two on the ground look back and spot that everyone are now gone and the horses have run away. Predator now has found the French. Hearing screams in the background, one guy tries to make a run for it but gets completely shrecked. Naru says this thing doesn't want to hunt this way as they are tied up. Also, Tabe comes out and says Naru technically killed the lion. It was weaker. And then he goes on to say that if this thing can bleed, we can kill it. God, what a sexual Tyrannosaurus. The French now attempt to just take this thing down as <laughs> it's not happening. Like open confrontation with this thing and it's just wrecking everyone. So this counterattack plan failed miserably. Basically all the trappers were either turned into meat cubes or had their brain stems cut short. This creature also released a small portable concussive force detonator as the rest of the French then ran back to camp to grab what they could and GTFO. One of them literally is like, oh, by the way, take out a dog. Like why would you waste your time taking out the dog? I have no idea. If this thing was on my tail, I would not care. I don't even think I would go back to camp. You would just catch me like literally sprinting through the woods. Naru, however, takes out the trappers in a fight, which is pretty badass, and then saves the quadruped. All that time, the predator did take some hits and is forced to cauterize his wounds, which gives Naru some time. As she works on some stuff, the one Frenchman who knows her language from earlier arrives at the camp asking for help for his missing leg. She puts some medicine on his leg in exchange for learning how to use the handheld musket deliverer. Naru then gives him medicine to cool his blood, but as she helps helps him, she nopes out of there as the Predator has found the camp. He plays dead, but then the uh, yeah, Predator kind of just spots that he crawled and his blood was warm. Getting over to him, he doesn't really see the heat, and as Naru learns, it can't see him because his blood is cold. But then it stabs the Frenchman and takes him out. So player three now has entered the game. Tabe then smacks the Predator in the head, revealing part of a face only a mother could love. Naru goes on to pop a shot as Tabe then is able to spear this thing through the chest. Before it goes invisible mode like a total loser, Tabe is now attacked as the thing shows up behind him and spears him. See, this thing isn't even that good. In that moment, it would have been totally got. It just cheats. As it approaches Naru, Tabe then stabs it in the leg, but is taken out by the Predator as Naru disappears Batman style. Naru and Tabe's mother is now told about the ending of Tabe somehow. I'm not really sure how news traveled that fast, to be honest with you, but Naru has now hidden away next to a river as the Frenchman cleans himself up further up river. She elects to not attack as he can probably be used as bait. Running up, she then knocks him out and she cuts off his leg, which uh, by the way, this is Big Beard, not just some random French dude. As he goes to load his handheld, she takes some of the orange plant, which cools her blood. The Predator then walks past her towards Big Beard, separating his bearded head away from his body. Naru is then able to get a shot off and blows away his mask, keeping it for herself. She then sets up his helmet, and naturally, I mean, he wants to find it. She leaves a trail for him to follow and hides in a tree. Jumping down, she's able to get a few hits with the axe, injuring the creature further. It goes to attack as the quadruped begins its attack as well. Now, the Predator is super angry about this whole thing, and in its anger, it acts accidentally chops off its own arm with its shield. The fight continues with Naru almost losing her head to the shield mechanics, but she's able to get away. Eventually, she's able to grab it and fell the creature into the quicksand. However, this thing is too strong for that, and it's also like nine feet tall. It pulls out a bolt as it fires, and the bolt misses Naru and circles back around, nailing it through the head. Naru then shows up with this thing's head, as probably everyone there has no clue what this thing even is, and Naru is now promoted to war chief because, I mean, she did just take out a predator. So the moral of the story is, get a predator mad, and it becomes three 100% more dumb, allowing you to take it out. You're one ugly man.
motherfucker. So to kick this thing off, we need to first learn about humans and how in relation to us, we're not so different, you and I. The Yaucha are bipedal species as seen. In fact, much like humans, their physiology is strikingly similar if you move past the Sangheili facial features, which I think we all know. Halo took inspiration from the Yaucha for the creation of Sangheili. I mean, they even cloak. Anyhow, I had a migraine yesterday, uh, so expect this to be a little scattered, because literally that's actually a symptom of the postrome, which, oh god, it sucks. But back on subject. In human society, there are many different versions of us. In fact, throughout all of history and us coming to be what we are now, there were even different species of the genus Homo that humans would interact with. The biggest one being Neanderthal. Now, the thing to note about humans is the typical hell belief is that humans, as Homo sapiens, are about 100,000 years old. Well, prepare to get your mind blown, because now there's evidence to suggest that we are actually about 300,000 years old, which would make our current technological leap highly impressive or even more impressive than it already is, given that just really that amount of time in the last 200 years amounts to 0.0006% of our time being sapiens, which means we went completely from the mercy of elements to leaving our planet to more recently actually just having figured out sustained fusion reaction in a reactor. Basically, we're pretty awesome. But the point to all this is, with a very short amount of time considering how old a species may be, there were versions of us on this planet that we could interbreed with, but were definitely not us. Neanderthals, quite a while back, used to populate much of Europe. Having migrated there during the original first push out of Africa, they were likely Homo erectus. Now, there were a whole host of issues for this species to be dealing with, such as mRNA viruses, which I'm sure was an absolute blast. And spoiler, it wasn't actually uh, a blast because the erectus body was more adept at dealing with parasites and viruses. But eventually, this would result in Homo neanderthalensis. Later on, we find evidence that Homo erectus that chose to stay in Africa would eventually evolve into Homo sapiens. And upon running into their former kin in Europe, the differences were fairly striking, whereas Homo neanderthalensis would be more stocky and muscular with a wider face and lighter skin due to the angle of the sun and colder climate, Homo sapiens would be more lithe with a darker complexion due to the angle of the sun, which necessitated more pigmentation to protect the nucleus within the cell. On top of this, they were taller and had smaller faces with a slightly smaller skull. The point of all this is that the two species existed in the same time frame and eventually would go on to interbreed because let's be honest here, uh, as a species, when the hour gets late and you've been partying, who knows? Maybe you will take that Neanderthal home at the end of the bar because they start looking pretty good. Well, this ultimately results in a lot of our current iteration of species to carry genetic information of Neanderthal lenses. However, they do appear to be, or appear to have been, bred completely out as there were really more sapiens and we were more social. But moving back over to the Yaucha, not only do they look similar to humans in terms of build, but there appears to be a similar dichotomy within their species as well. Taking, for instance, the Yaucha in the movie Predator, like the original Predator, like with Dutch, this specific version of Yaucha appears much more comfortable in a jungle environment. In fact, their planet is said to have two biomasses. One is a jungle biome with dense jungles, which provides plenty of shade and a moist environment. And somebody just cringed at the fact that I use moist. And these Yaucha appear to be radically different from the predators known as the feral predators from the other biome. This biome is said to be a giant desert. It may still be humid, likely not, considering it's a desert, but there is very little cover overhead from its binary star system. Over time, this would result in two different versions of the predator that may have intermingled or may not have intermingled as much as sapiens did with Neanderthalensis. And as a result, this left the two species who are likely from the same genus, but have become different species. And in fact, let's take a look at the possible evolutionary pathways that created the feral predator. If I had to take a crack at it, I would potentially say that Yaucha Prime was not what is considered today, which is the main issue with the binary star system. Twice the energy received from the suns, given that the Yaucha are bipedal, we can almost apply the human evolutionary pathway to them. See, prior to humans, or really even Homo erectus, we know a change happened around the era of Australopithecus, where the foot shape began to change because they had to start standing upright. Standing upright became necessary as the environment around them changed from dense jungle to savanna with tall grasses. This also meant that our arms, used to basically grapple with trees, was really no longer necessary, and as a result, our arms got shorter and our feet changed from grasping limbs to walking limbs. As we stood upright, the brain became supported by bone rather than by muscle, allowing for it to get larger, which would result in us becoming more intelligent. But the other thing that happened is we started cracking into bones to get bone marrow for nutrition, which then led to cooking, which led to more nutrition, which led to us getting more intelligent. Basically, everything was turning up Millhouse. Then the aforementioned leaving Africa began, which resulted in different physical appearances amongst species. I believe the same thing happened to the Yaucha. We know on their planet that they have quite a bit of volcanic activity, and it may be possible that some of their suns currently producing more energy than what had happened when they were one species running around the global jungle, or at least confined to a specific area in the 
jungle. And because of this, much like how the Sahara Desert undergoes a transformation of turning into a grassland every 20,000 years, Yalcha Prime may have undergone a similar event. Now, it could have been a combination of volcanic activity coupled with the suns, but potentially what happened is the Yaucha existed in a global jungle. They may have really only been on one part of the planet. It could have been a continent, much like humans were. As the jungle environment around them began to change into something like a savanna, which is a precursor to a desert, they began to stand upright. Their arms got shorter, bipedalism took over, and they became a lot like humans in a lot of ways, which we will go over the feral predator's physiology momentarily, which will help us understand these adaptations. But as the area became more and more dry, likely some Yaucha would throw deuces to the area, deciding to move on, whereas others may have continued to stay, probably finding a stable source of water, not requiring them to move on. This ancient event for Yaucha would eventually result in two strikingly different versions of the Yaucha, whereas those who decide to move on into the jungles would maintain a lighter skin tone, likely brought on by existing on the jungle floor, away from the strong direct sunlight, those who resided in the desert would develop a darker complexion and become more lithe to basically lose heat. Look, all I'm saying is, basically what happened to humanity appears to have happened on Yaucha Prime as well. Now, something to note before moving on is that there is like a lot of different versions of Yaucha, and likely due to how intelligent their race is and their technological prowess, there could be some direct gene manipulation happening, creating new versions of Yaucha. Anyhow, ultimately, the division between biomasses on their home planet would result in two very different Yaucha that are still the same genus, but might not be the same species, which resulted in different visual adaptations. Whereas the Yaucha that come from the jungle would have plasma casters and appeared more technologically advanced, sporting metal armoring and a potentially more developed reasoning ability when it comes to trying to figure out if a prey species is attempting to trap them, the feral predator appears less technologically inclined, having a tracking bolt arm cannon rather than a plasma caster. On top of this, they favor bone armoring, which when coming across human force multipliers at the time, was able to withstand a direct hit with a musket. But against their own technology, the bone does very little. And coupled with this, they also sport a shield to protect their body from direct hits that could also double as a way to kind of separate the three pound anxiety meat from the rest of the body. All that said, however, they would still have ships capable of traversing the cosmos, so they far outclass humans in terms of technology, regardless of if they were the jungle or desert variant. And honestly, considering how technologically advanced they are as a species, they probably all work together and trade amongst clans. So how exactly does the feral predator differ physically from the standard Yaucha? Well, physically overall, there's really actually not too many differences. Concerning limb placements, they are bipedal, just like every other Yaucha. However, with that said, they do appear to be taller than the other jungle faring Yaucha. Coupled with that, they also appear to be less muscular, but in reality, it's more likely due to the fact that they're taller and the muscle is more stretched out. Sort of like comparing uh, muscle pound for pound on a six foot eight man who lifts weights and is as strong as someone who's five foot eight. They have similar muscle strength and likely amount, but the taller of the two is going to appear less bulky due to bone length. The skin of the feral predator is much darker than its jungle compatriot as well, and this would be highly necessary to its survival. Due to the binary star system that Yaucha Prime orbits, the surface of the planet is absolutely blasted with solar radiation as well as ultraviolet light. Now, for life to exist as it does on Yaucha Prime, it would need a strong magnetosphere to actually block out the more dangerous bands of radiation, but UV radiation is still something that the species would have to contend with. The issue with UV radiation is it has a tendency to just absolutely screw up your DNA, which let's talk about what it would be doing to the Yaucha genome for a moment based on what it does to human DNA or really any animal DNA on the planet. When UV radiation radiation hits a cell, it will shine through the surface of the cell and then pass through the nucleus. When it does this, it will strike the DNA and this could result in something known as a thymine dimer. Thymine dimer is when two thymines next to one another will connect rather than with the adenine across it. And it should be known that cytosine can do the same thing, pairing with a cytosine next to it. But this ultimately leaves guanine hanging. When the cell then undergoes mitosis, the cell attempts to copy its DNA to send to the daughter cell. And this thymine dimer will cause an issue because the cell really won't know what was supposed to go there. Now, the body does have an ability to break these two apart using a nucleotide excision enzyme, which is pretty metal sounding, but it will clip out the base, allowing for it to be repaired, utilizing the coating that was across from it. But even then, it really doesn't directly recognize it. Basically, UV radiation is really bad for your body. So what's the fix? Pigmentation. Well, it's kind of a fix. With the feral predator, the darker complexion would be necessary as there are no trees overhead to block out the sunlight, meaning that the Yaucha, if they're going to survive the constant onslaught of this intense ultraviolet radiation, they would need to protect their cells. This pigmentation will gather in front of the nucleus and absorb incoming light and radiation, giving them a physical barrier to the alterations of UV radiation. It's also likely that on a cellular level, they have more precise nucleotide excision enzymes that would repair the DNA or at least cut away the dimers within their own DNA 
DNA correction method coming in to keep them alive. But apart from skin tone, they also appear to have thicker skin overall. This thicker skin would allow for more protection as possibly the top layer of skin, not only being darker, but being uh, essentially a thicker dead layer like we humans have. And this would block more radiation in the process, protecting the newer skin underneath. And we see this thickness of skin, specifically on the shoulder of this creature, but also in general, since it's getting sliced by literally everyone possible trying to survive an interaction with it, and it really doesn't receive that much damage. Now, moving on to the massive differences with this creature is the head. The head of the feral predator is quite different from its jungle-dwelling brethren. Whereas the Yalcha from the jungle have a more rounded frontal forehead, the feral predator has his extend further upwards into a crest. This crest branches out, hiding the connection to the dread-like appendages that this creature has. Due to this more flat cresting, as well as protruding further, this means large forehead gang rise up. And also the dreads themselves are longer. Now it has been hypothesized that the dreads kind of act as some sort of way for the Yaucha to cool itself off, which considering the jungle Yaucha just have thicker dreads, which are shorter, would be great for them. But the feral predator actually has longer dreads and in greater numbers, which allows for more wind to pass through, which may cool it off even more effectively. The facial structure overall are different as well. Around the brow ridge of this creature, rather than having sunken back eyes like the jungle Yaucha, they are recessed, but the brow ridge, instead of running across, is more perpendicular and at a much sharper angle, almost blocking the eyes somewhat. The reasoning for this adaptation to exist would largely be due to the fact that it would be blindingly bright out in the desert. Like, have you ever been out in a the desert? There's not much to absorb the light, and the albedo can be fairly high if the sand is light in coloring. And as a result, not only are your eyes contending with the suns overhead, but are contending with the same light being reflected into your eyes as well. This predator would need to block out some of this light and provide the light sensitive organ some form of protection. This can help to protect the eyes from projectiles as well in case of a sandstorm. Moving down to the mouth, we see a very interesting setup. While it has four mandibles, much like the jungle Yaucha, they do not appear as long. Instead, they appear larger and thicker, perhaps stronger than the jungle variant mandibles. The jaw itself also appears to contain the mouth better in the feral predator. This could be for a multitude of reasons, but unfortunately, someone already beat me to it, so I gotta give him a shout out on it. On Twitter, a guy named Michael Vincent Art, or at least that's his Twitter handle, remarked on how the jaw appears stronger to break bones, and I'd have to agree. And for that, we go back to human evolution. Back in the day when we had a lot more fur, our species would stumble across a source of nutrition in the carcasses that would begin making us more intelligent. And this is bone marrow. Now I mentioned it earlier, but we go a little more in depth. Bone marrow is highly nutritious and can absolutely sustain you. The best part was that a lot of predators on Earth would just eat the meat and leave the bones alone for the most part. When the predators left, as a skeleton was really picked clean, our ancestors would approach the bones, gnaw on them, and break them open to get to the calorie-dense marrow. As time passed, this would lead to us becoming omnivores, which again, cooking and all that. This initial calorie push gave our brains the nutrition it would need to result in us. The Yaucha likely had a similar scenario. Because the feral predators are likely to be the original iteration and potentially where this species even originally started out, these adaptations may have been the original ones that the other Yaucha would lose over time or adapt in different ways considering the biomes. But the stronger appearing jaw of the feral predator would mean it's more than capable of crushing bone and getting to the nutrition, which when you are in a desert, prior to becoming technologically advanced, any food in this area would need to be utilized to its greatest potential. Because there's no guarantee in an environment like this, you would run across a meal as easily as say in, in the jungle biome. But what's also interesting is the feral predator's choice and how it chooses to outfit itself. Unlike the jungle Yaucha, the feral Yaucha choose to wear bone masks instead, which arguably indicates less protecting or less protective ability than the metal mask, but likely still has its roots in more ceremonial purposes. So it's a choice, potentially honoring the older iterations of identities, whereas the jungle Yaucha, they're really more about being a better hunter and the older ways weren't as prevalent as they moved away from their original species origin area. I believe the bone mask is absolutely more of a cultural choice than a technology issue, seeing as the feral predator 300 years ago had access to many different technologies, similar to what we saw the jungle Yaucha using, but chose to hunt in a different way according to its customs. Kind of hard to imagine the Yaucha having different cultural preferences, but hey, if we can have it, why not a more technologically advanced species? Not to mention, given the different clans and their interactions and emphasis on honorable hunts, this clan is likely not in conflict with the elder Yaucha in any real capacity, considering it will not hunt trapped prey but instead prefers to go after who's a threat, much like the Yaucha Dutch ran into. Which, by the way, if you want to watch a video on that, I will link it at the end of this video. I covered this variant about two years ago. But ultimately, this feral predator is a product of its environment. It's odd to call them feral when in reality, due to the cultural choices it makes, as well as the use of its advanced technology, I really don't think it's all that feral. In reality, it hails from a more dry, desert side of the planet that is blasted by UV 
radiation at a more intense angle. And as a result, this caused it to physically adapt to this area. However, one of the things I would also like to bring out before rounding this thing out is its intelligence. I could potentially see it being feral based on if we are using Yaucha standards. The Yaucha are highly intelligent. It would appear that the jungle variants may have a slight advantage for one reason or another based on how even after fighting with Dutch and going back to his original hiding place, it located traps as it seemed more collected and reserved when chasing its prey. The feral predator, after having his almonds activated, will choose to aggressively attack its prey in what appears to definitely be anger. Because of this, logical thought seems somewhat subdued, which if the brain structure is to basically be considered similar to humans, the jungle variant does have a larger frontal lobe than the feral versions, and this could also be due to the larger, more powerful jaws, which just like with our ancestors, limited brain capacity. Again, large forehead gang rise up. But this is not to say the feral predator isn't as intelligent, at least way more intelligent, than humans. But it's still able to be tricked by rustling its jimmies just enough to get it into a rage, which allowed for Naru to take it out using its own technology. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leaving a like would be great, and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and streaming channels in the description. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our two astronauts, Charles and Wesley A. Weaver Jr. Thank you very much, guys. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, as well as our scientists, Countryside Limbo, Demon Ripper, and Phoenix. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards helping out and is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see you all in the next one.